We'll begin our tour of the reconstructed military site by starting north of Pluckerman and the cantonment itself. The view here is to the south, with the village of Pluckerman barely visible in the background. To the left rises the Wachung Mountains, whose wooded slopes would house the army. Located on a road that ran north from Pluckerman towards Bernersville and Morristown, stood the Jacobus Vanderveer House. General Henry Knox commandeered this house as his headquarters for the winter of 1778-79, and he was joined by his family, who traveled south to be with him. Whenever Knox found it necessary to leave the comfort of the Vanderveer House, he would have traveled south along the road to Pluckerman to join his troops. As he rode, he passed over the Raritan River with a gristmill and a sawmill that may have provided supplies to his troops. Not shown here are features such as a dam, a mill pond, and raceways that would have been on the site itself. Beyond the river was another Vanderbeer house, that of Dr. Henry Vanderbeer, and then he would have approached the village of Pluckerman. But before he reached the village, Knox would have turned left, climbing the slope of the second Wachung Mountain. As we approach the buildings of the artillery cantonment, we can better visualize the height of the Wachung Mountains in the background. The Americans installed signal beacons on the top of these hills in a chain reaching down towards Middlebrook and then north past New York City. If the British tried to move out of the city, the beacons would be lit, raising the alarm across the countryside. As the troops arrived on the site in December of 1778, they essentially stripped the hillside of trees, using the wood for building and then for heating and cooking. Stone was gathered and all of these materials form the basis for an ambitious collection of buildings. Drawn up in the shape of an E stood on its side, the five major buildings surrounded two parade grounds, large open spaces where the troops could muster and drill, with a guardhouse and a line of cannon in front of the entire complex. Panning across the structures that make up the cantonment, the most obvious feature is the 30 by 50 foot academy building in the center of the camp. Flanked on its left by a headquarters building, and on its right by the new line of barracks, it dominated the center of the camp. It also had a dominant role in Knox and Washington's purpose for the camp. Classes and instruction for artillery officers were held in the building on a daily basis. They were taught by Christopher Collis, an inventor and scientist who schooled them in mathematics, physics, and the other intricacies of gunnery and ordnance. Knox fully understood the importance of comprehensive military training, and this building was the nation's first military academy, the precursor to West Point. To the left of the academy in the new line of barracks, drawn up along the base of the hill, was a barracks building for officers. Field grade officers, the two lieutenant colonels who were at the camp all winter, overlooked them from a more spacious building constructed up on the hill. But the most ambitious building was probably the original line of barracks constructed at the north end of the site. This long line of barracks stretched for a distance of more than 450 feet. Although shown by John Lilly as one continuous building with a common roof line, this type of construction would have been virtually impossible to achieve. The ground drops over 60 feet in elevation over its entire length, making a common roof line impractical. A likely solution to this engineering problem was to have the troops level out a series of platforms down the hill dividing the structure into separate units or apartments comprised of two rooms each. Each of these apartments was entered through a central door, which then gave way into two rooms, one on either side of a common chimney. As we approach the left end of the building, on the west or downhill side, the roof has been removed to show what an interior layout might have looked like. This is based on archaeological and historical evidence, but many elements are somewhat conjectural. Based on company rosters, it seems likely that a company was housed in each two-room apartment, with between 12 and 20 men in each room. Following the practice at other winter camps, bunks were probably stacked three high, and a fireplace provided each room with both heat and a place to cook meals. Although John Lilly shows no windows in the building in his drawing, company commanders were ordered to cut windows into the rear of the rooms as the warmer spring weather arrived. To the rear of the barracks was a scatter of cabins, probably constructed of log and designed to house camp followers, sutlers, and also for use as storage buildings. As we move up the hill, we can see that the slope has been stripped of trees for use in construction, heating, and cooking. 
We can also see some additional details in the field officers' quarters. More spacious than any of the other buildings at the camp, this structure was placed on a small terrace on the hillside, and it overlooked the entire cantonment, a truly impressive sight. Looking out their windows, these officers would have seen the cantonment's five long buildings, stretching from 200 to 450 feet in length, which were ambitious by any standard. The academy, the first of its kind, took center stage, while off in the distance the villages and the fertile fields of New Jersey provided a reminder of what the Continental Army was fighting for. While the north end of the site was dedicated to housing soldiers, the south end bustled with activity related to supply and logistics. This work was driven in part by the many artificers or craftsmen on the site. Their barracks stretched along the base of the hill with chimneys in the rear of their rooms. These quarters were flanked by their workshops, where tinsmiths, gunsmiths, blacksmiths, and farriers repaired equipment and turned out new supplies. These goods, which included muskets and bayonets, cartridge boxes and canteens, were placed in warehouses at the south end of the site. Although depicted by John Lilly and mentioned in the documents, no archaeological evidence of these buildings has ever been found. This is probably because they were unheated and lightly built structures but they assumed an importance well out of character with their modest construction. Equipment turned out by the Pluckerman artificers was joined by material brought from all 13 states, going into the warehouses before being parceled out to the middle troops for the coming campaign. This was the core of a complex and far-reaching supply effort, an important logistical achievement for the American Army. Visitors approaching the Pluckerman site must have been impressed as well, and we have contemporary records of some of their reactions. One description of the camp, written by a guest at a grand ball held there to commemorate the anniversary of the French-American alliance on March 6th of 1779, said, The huts of this corps unfold themselves in a very pretty manner as you approach. A range of field pieces, mortars, and heavy cannon make up the front line of a parallelogram. The other sides are composed of huts for the officers and privates. There is also an academy where lectures read on tactics and gunnery, and work huts for those employed in the laboratory all very judiciously arranged. It's no wonder that Henry Knox reported with some pride that he had placed his troops into barracks which are comfortable and on an elegant plan, or that General Nathaniel Green could refer to the academy as the palace. The construction alone, completed in a matter of weeks, was remarkable, but the legacy of the Pluckerman camp was more far-reaching. For the artillery, an important routine of training and education was established, with drill and maneuver refined and practiced. From the standpoint of the larger army, the supply efforts of the military stores department at Pluckerman ensured that a well-supplied and formidably equipped army took the field in the spring of 1779. The winter of 1778-1779 was an interlude when the Continental Army resolved many of the logistical complexities that had plagued resupply in earlier years, and both the training and the supply efforts were critical components in their eventual success over the British Army. What's more, the combination of a training academy and industrial supply facility fulfilled the long-standing wish of both Knox and Washington. Although destined for a short life, the Pluckerman Academy was the nation's first military academy. The success of this experiment solidified an understanding in the new nation's leadership that any standing army would require both logistical support and training. This realization eventually came to fruition in 1802 at West Point. Today, the Pluckerman Archaeological Site is an important reminder of our nation's early struggles and one of its significant unnoticed successes. The collection of artifacts recovered in the 1980s continues to expand our understanding of this critical juncture in American history. Through a combination of historical and archaeological research, and with the aid of modern technology, this reconstruction reminds us of what our forebears accomplished during the times that tried men's souls.